Um, it's getting sort of late in the day, and I, I know we're all kind of wearing down a little bit. I got a little bit extra time that I'm not going to use, so I, I'm not going to abuse the extra couple of minutes. So let me just dive into this. Um, the talk here is about Rocky. That's the abstract. We'll skip over that. And, and I really got to thinking about, you know, RDMA in general provides low latency and offers scalability, and um, we can do Rocky, which lets us do RDMA over Ethernet. So now that we have this great tool, what are we going to do with it? And so I started thinking a little bit about where this might go, and um, was a little bit motivated by Ronald's thinking, so um, I'm going to blame him for most of what I'm going to say here. Uh, actually, um, if you saw his presentation this morning, we can probably just go to sleep here. But just on the odd chance that I have a little bit different take on it, maybe we'll go through this anyway. Um, I wanted to start with a, a completely non-profound, totally obvious observation, which is that every single server in the known universe has an Ethernet port. So I'm with Terry on this. I'm an Ethernet partisan, whether I like it or not. Um, don't tell my wife that, please, because she thinks I'm an IB guy, but, <clears throat> you know. <laughs> Anyway, it's sort of an important observation, as you'll see in a minute. Um, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about scale-out clusters. Um, again, another completely you know, obvious observation here is that scale-out clusters today are generally composed of uh, general-purpose servers interconnected by a cluster fabric. Nothing remarkable about that, except to say that if we wanted to do something interesting, in the cluster environment, we probably ought to both look at the fabric and the endpoint. We shouldn't look at just one or the other. Look at them together as a system. So that's what I'm going to try to do. And I'm going to start by taking a look at the canonical, as I call it, general purpose server, which I've labeled at the top there as being a scale up architecture. And they never talk about scale down. Did you ever notice that? <laughs> Um, but the idea behind a scale-up architecture is that with the basic, same basic server architecture, you can always make it bigger. You can add more cores and more sockets. You can add more chipsets. Um, you can add more memory. You can add more anything, more I.O. buses, more you name it, and it gets bigger, which is a good thing. That's a very good thing. This model has served us really, really, really well for a really long time. Um, in the particular case that I want to talk about, you know, if in, in clustering, you would really want to add a, some sort of a PCI adapter for low latency cluster. Um, and of course, there's a variety of, of interconnects available for storage. We all know about that. You know, it could be some form of SCSI, SAS, or SATA, or fiber channel, um, or even fiber channel over Ethernet. And the one constant thing about all of this is that there's always, always, always this Ethernet port, which is sort of key to the whole architecture. So I thought it might be helpful to look at that same general purpose server model from a little bit different perspective. I, I tend to look at things from the memory controller outwards. And this maybe comes from my experience at Intel as a chipset architect a number of years ago. Um, that's where you sort of start thinking at server architecture level and work your way out. And the observation is that there's really two ports um, into any main memory in most servers today. There's a coherency port of some sort or other, could be hypertransport, could be QPI, and that's all I'm going to say in the subject of coherency ports, except to say that there is this notion of a coherent port into memory. The other one that I'm much more interested in is the I.O. port, and I'm interested in it because I'm an I.O. guy. Um, and I really think that one way to think about this is that you should think of that I.O. port as another port into and out of main memory. There are really <coughs> excuse me, two differences between the coherency port and the I.O. port. One is one has a coherency protocol and the other doesn't. Yeah, you could argue that in hypertransport that's not exactly the case, but for our purposes here it's close enough. The other is that the processor vendors tend to, to hold the coherency port as uh, intellectual property, which is entirely appropriate, whereas they tend to open the I.O. port and make it a standard. It's PCI Express. And we all know that. It's, it's, it's the port du jour. Um, so I guess that's all I need to say about that picture. So let me move on. Looking a little bit closer um, at the I.O. port and, and it's sort of its derivation, as you think about that I.O. bus there that, you know, that connects to the I.O. port, and it's really designed for one purpose only, which is to connect PCI Express adapters to the memory complex. That's what it does. 
And that's what makes this platform architecture that we're looking at so general purpose. It means you can change the entire complement of the uh, I.O. subsystem underneath the memory controller simply by changing the complement of devices that are plugged into a, what I would call a generic um, I.O. memory port, if you prefer. Um, and there's good and historical reasons for doing this sort of thing. Because for a very long time, the physical layers um, underneath those I.O. devices were all unique, which meant that there was a unique I.O. adapter associated with each particular I.O. protocol. Um, for example, there's a fiber channel adapter, let's say, or a SCSI adapter, or an Ethernet adapter. And the underlying wires were different, so it made perfect sense that the adapters themselves would be different. But um, one of the ad advances I think that we're making as an industry, particularly over the past couple of years, and, and uh, momentum is building in this direction, is that differences in the underlying uh, physical layers themselves are going away at a pretty rapid rate. So we're converging pretty quickly. Um, so talking for just a second about storage, so storage is one of those protocols that typically has its own adapter. There does seem to be a trend in the industry towards this notion of disaggregation of storage out of the server platform itself. Um, of course, you still buy servers today and they still have uh, rotating media on them, and I'm not saying that that model has gone away by any stretch of the imagination, but there are certainly segments of, of the industry, and I think maybe even increasing segments of the industry, where the storage is being collected away from the servers and aggregated somewhere on the net and delivered as a service to uh, the application servers, whether that's a file-based storage or block-based storage or, you know, I really don't don't really care that much. The point is that it's disaggregated away from the server itself. And if that's true, if we can sort of accelerate that trend, again, at least for certain segments of the market, we may be able to um, move towards our goal of rationalizing the I.O. subsystem in the server by eliminating at least one interconnect. So I've fixed one problem. With respect to IP and, and uh, IP networking and IPC, um, of course it makes perfect sense that you should be able to do either of those over any uh, particular underlying fabric. Um, the choice today would happen to be Ethernet, simply because it's everywhere. <coughs> and I wanted to point out that as far as um, IPC goes, there's really two ways that you can do that. One is you can superimpose an IPC fabric on top of an IP fabric, or you could run the IPC fabric directly on top of Ethernet. It really, for our purposes here, doesn't matter all that much. The point I'm trying to make here is that the obvious, just to make the point again, <laughs> The obvious place to start when you're looking at a fabric would be Ethernet, which says something about what the right port into and out of memory is. Nothing surprising so far. <coughs> so if, in fact, um, we can encapsulate storage protocols within messages, which we know we can do, there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, it turns out that ICER or SRP are particularly straightforward ways of doing it, but there's lots of other ways to do it as well. And we know we have a couple of options for IP traffic and IPC traffic. Then I'm thinking that maybe it's possible to get away with just a single port into and out of main memory. That may be the way to go here. It's a message based port, you know, it's not IO protocol specific. Let me elaborate on that for just a second. What I mean by it's not an IO protocol versus a messaging protocol. <clears throat> I think of RDMA is being a messaging service. You know, all it does is moves messages back and forth. And if it turns out that the I.O. protocol is encapsulated in the payload in a message, then you've abstracted the I.O. protocol away from the underlying message service altogether. And that's sort of the root of the idea that we can get down to just a single port into and out of memory. It's a messaging port. <clears throat> So once again, um, Ethernet is the obvious candidate for this unified notion of an I.O. memory port. So what does that mean with respect to the server architecture itself? We're all in search of nirvana here, where nirvana is the notion of a balanced server, which roughly means that um, traffic in and out of the um, memory complex from the I.O. port is balanced to traffic in and out of the memory port to the coherency port, uh, to the processors if you prefer. 
So what I'm getting at here is that it, building a balanced server in an environment like this, I think, becomes somewhat easier. You don't have to worry about the allocation of memory bandwidth to different classes of I.O. traffic. All you have to do from a server construction perspective is be sure that that single I.O. port, whatever it is, has sufficient bandwidth to support the number of cores that you want on your server. Or looked at inversely, you put the right number of cores to match whatever the underlying bandwidth is. So I guess I won't go there just now, but um, so as long as the sum of the storage traffic plus the IP traffic plus the IPC traffic is less than or equal to the capacity of that underlying I.O. port, you know, things are really, really good, depending on whatever the capacity of that port may be. Uh, we're obviously headed towards 10 gig, and at least in some environments like InfiniBand, we're headed towards 40 gig and also with Ethernet for that matter. But I guess I'm wondering, does it really make sense to put increasingly large ports to a single server? You know, can we really put enough processors up there that can consume all that memory? Or inversely, can we put large enough I.O. ports that can, can consume all of that, um, the processing power that's available to us? There's a little parenthetical footnote here that says, provided that we don't burn up too much memory bandwidth or CPU cycles in the process of delivering packets to applications. And that's where I want to go next. I want to focus on that little parenthetical comment. Um, if you think about it for just a second, that's the value proposition of RDMA. Uh, what it says is that I don't burn up IO, uh, sorry, processor cores doing things like executing IO stacks. And I don't do things like waste memory bandwidth doing copies. So if I can avoid copies and if I can reduce the load on the processor, all to the good. Um, I'm nowhere near at the level of analysis that Ronald showed this morning as far as the, the picojoules and the nanojoules of, that it takes to access these two. But in general, it seems to me that if you can offload the CPUs and use the CPUs for what they're good at doing, you're likely to be ahead of the game at least in some way, shape, or form. So to me, the thought would be, you know, let's optimize that single port into and out of memory um, as a, you know, as a, a, a message passing port based on RDMA. It just seems like the natural thing to do. Um, there's a couple of ways that we could do that, a couple of forms of RDMA we could use, because as we all know, the verbs API is transport independent. The last discussion notwithstanding, it could be InfiniBand, it could be iWarp, it could be Rocky, it doesn't really much matter. But since this talk is about Rocky, I'm going to ignore both IB and iWarp as options here and focus strictly on Rocky as the RDMA engine sitting above the Ethernet fabric. So we're getting pretty close to what I think I would call a dense server, um, a server designed specifically for dense applications. Again, this is not a general purpose, you know, one size fits all kind of server architecture, but there are environments out there where people are building clusters where what you really want to do is pack as many of these things together as you can and you have workloads that distribute nicely across what I would call smaller, more granular units of compute. Um, I'm not enough of a computer scientist to know what those applications are, but my guts are telling me that they're out there. Uh, so if you do this, really what you've got is what I would call a scale-down cluster processor. So it's sort of the inverse of scale-up. Um, rather than add more and more CPU, maybe you start taking CPUs away until you get to the point when whatever the commodity underlying wire speed of that, our RDMA-enabled Ethernet port happens to be, you put the right number of cores there to match that capacity there, and those cores are strictly devoted to application processing. So we're not doing any, you know, we're not doing any um, onload of, of, C, of TCP stacks, none of that stuff, none of that stuff going on on the processor itself. It's really all about running applications in the, in the, uh, the processor. So I think of these things as in the little box in the bottom says fine-grained particles of compute consisting of a CPU memory complex and an I.O. memory port, and that's it. Nothing else. No jazz, nothing else. Um, maybe a small caveat for a little bit of flash if we can't find a way to boot over the fabric, which it seems to me we probably can. So that's this notion of a scale-down uh, cluster processor that uh, personally I would like to see emerge. Um, I think it's going to help us out. 
And by the way, this thing delivers all the well-known benefits, you know, this little list here, laundry list of the well-known benefits of RDMA that go along with it. So we're going to get, you know, maximum utilization out of the processor core that we have. Um, we're going to improve cluster performance because everybody knows that RDMA makes everything better, right? Um, just like cold milk and Wheaties. Uh, reduce memory bandwidth. Uh, we don't talk about that often, but, but to me, it seems to me if we're avoiding copies that we're reducing load on the memory uh, bandwidth port. And generally speaking, that is the most expensive resource on a server uh, in terms of dollars and in terms of performance is the, the memory bandwidth itself. Uh, and we get to a balanced performance kind of a server model where the number of CPUs or the capacity of the CPUs, if you will, is well balanced by the underlying I.O. infrastructure, which is now this single message passing port. And now that I have that, I can scale it. And I can do it really easily because I have PowerPoint. <coughs> So I can just scale this thing as much as I want. So I took a baseboard and arbitrarily stuck a whole lot of these things on that, that baseboard. What I sort of neglected to show, sort of neglected on purpose, but right here, you can't see it, but right there is a switch chip. So the thought here would be, why can't you take these things in very high density and package them right in the switch chassis? Um, and things now look a lot different than they used to. Imagine walking into a, a computer room, a server computer room, and there's no more servers. All there is is a bunch of Ethernet switches. It's sort of an interesting thought. But, well, I, I hope so. <laughs> um, so summarizing as far as the server platform goes, and again, I said we needed to do two things. We needed to look at the fabric, and we needed to look at the endpoint. So we've looked at the endpoint with a brief detour into the fabric. I'll come back to the fabric in just a second. But just to summarize here, if we disaggregate storage away from the server platform, uh, at least in my mind, all sorts of good things start to happen. Um, in particular, the workloads that are left from an I.O. perspective are very amenable to RDMA-style um, solutions, not that storage isn't. Doing storage over RDMA is a great and good and just thing to do, and there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to attach our disaggregated storage via this same RDMA-enabled messaging port. Uh, implementing RDMA as the I.O. memory port gives us a very efficient compute cluster uh, with cl shared storage, we talked about that, and access to client networking, um, and did I mention the IPC port as well. So at least to me it appears that if you wanted to build a really dense server, a really dense server, what you would do is you would start with an RDMA enabled Ethernet port. It makes an awful lot of sense. So moving on and looking a little bit at the fabrics, um, we already decided earlier on, and I did this by fiat because it's my talk, so I'm allowed to do that, that that fabric was going to be Ethernet for any number of reasons. Uh, I don't think anyone in the room would disagree with that. But there are some challenges associated with you know, classical Ethernet. Um, some of these have been solved by various switch vendors. I don't want to claim that they haven't. But I just wanted to sort of look at the general universe of issues surrounding uh, Ethernet and the way it's used today. And I, I guess the root of all evils, um, to my perception anyway, is a spanning tree protocol, which does really, really great things because it means you can just plug in switches and they all work. And that's a, there's a, a lot of value in that. But there may not be a lot of value in it in certain applications like in data centers where bisectional bandwidth is really important, support for arbitrary topologies is really important, um, latency, being able to select the shortest diameter fabric is really important. There's a number of things that spanning tree doesn't do especially well, uh, and I think we can improve on all of those. So to that end, I, you know, I begin thinking a little bit about what happens in InfiniBand. You know, when you got an InfiniBand hammer, everything's a nail. And I think about the way InfiniBand manages its fabrics, and it has a centralized notion of a fabric management function of some sort or other. It's uh, sort of the inverse of the Ethernet world where you walk into a dark room and you don't really know what's happening, and the fabric kind of connects itself. In the InfiniBand world, or in this case, the centrally managed Ethernet fabric world, you have somebody who can see the entire fabric. And if that somebody can see the whole fabric, then it fo follows, obviously, that he can do things like select optimal routes through the fabric. Um, he can make 
full advantage of the available bisectional bandwidth, <coughs> excuse me, because he doesn't have to turn off ports in order to avoid credit loops. You know, all the things that spanning tree does in the name of making things simple and efficient, we don't have to do in places where we really care about the performance of the fabric itself. Uh, we can route around congestion fairly easily. Well, fairly easily is a relative thing, right? And most important of all, there's this notion of jitter reduction. So the, the more direct you can make the fabric and the elimination of routers and so forth, there are some environments like pods, for example, in particular in financial industry, there's areas where jitter is really, really important to these guys. Um, latency matters, but what matters almost even more is differences in latency. So they like to see a fixed, well-defined path from end to end that they always know it's going to be three microseconds or whatever it is. So if you're managing a fabric like this, you can do things like manage the jitter a bit more efficiently. So there's my plug for a central managed Ethernet fabric. There are um, lots of ways to accomplish this. This is just one that I've been thinking about a little bit. Um, in this case it uses OpenFlow. Um, the role of OpenFlow in this case is OpenFlow doesn't define this notion of a fabric controller at all. What OpenFlow does is defines a communications protocol that allows a fabric controller to go in and manipulate the, lin uh, the linear forwarding tables in each switch and, and program the, the, uh, the fabric in that way. So there's nothing magic about OpenFlow. It just happened to be convenient. There are other uh, routing protocols that we should be looking at like Trill and things like that. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail about those because amongst other things I don't understand Trill very well. Just to say that there is this notion of a centrally managed Ethernet fabric and if we had it we'd really be somewhere. So where I was going with the fabric thing is it should be possible now to build really large flat address layer two fabrics. And I guess the observation for me is that in a lot of environments there are places where an entire subnet really does not need to be routable. It really is just a subnet. And those fabrics could be very, very, very large, potentially very large. <coughs> um, you take a typical HPC environment, for example, and there's not a lot of routers in there. It's one, one flat subnet. Uh, all right, so moving on. So let me just sort of summarize very quickly. I'm getting to the end. I told you I wasn't going to take a lot of time, and I'm glad to say I haven't. You think about traditional servers. They're built of flexible, what I call monolithic servers. And they're monolithic because they include all the pieces of a server in one piece, which is to say processor, memory complex, and an I.O. subsystem. That's the way we've typically built monolithic servers in the past, based on lots of cores, many threads, um, highly integrated, and a fairly complex I.O. subsystem underneath them. Uh, and what I'm suggesting here is that we look at building scale-down servers, I coined a term here, um, by rationalizing the I.O. subsystem underneath a monolithic server. And if you rationalize that subsystem, you wind up with a pretty simple looking particle of compute that you can connect to a, a high-performance switched fabric. Servers already have LOM, LOM LAN on motherboard. Um, my thought would be to upgrade this to a rocky, rocky packet processing engine of some sort because I really want to be able to run this thing over the lightest weight fabric I can imagine. There are vendors who might take me up on this and build this on iWarp instead, and that's fine. I'm in favor of that as well. Doesn't much matter. I just would like to see um, an RDMA engine built into the into the server chipset. I think that'd be the bee's knees if we could get to that point. And you combine these with a flat, centrally managed layer two network, and you've got an extremely high performance but very dense cluster. So let me just summarize in the most succinct way I can think of efficient, fine-grained, scale-down endpoints. That's our little servers with very efficient layer two fabrics. And I didn't put an equals because, you know, proof is left to the reader. And that's what I have to say. I'm going to put this one slide up that was provided to me. Um, this is where we are with Rocky right now. I don't think I'm going to go through the bullet points on this slide, but I'll leave it there so you can look at it. The point is that Rocky is really real. It's really here. It's under development. We're gaining a lot of steam. We heard it mentioned at least a couple times today in ways that sort of surprised me um, in a pleasant way, I must say. So with that, any questions?